Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. If this is the first time you guys tuning in, uh, we are a meetup that we do, uh, you know, bi-monthly. Uh, we invite bi uh, speakers bi-monthly to talk about a variety of different commercial real estate topics. Today, I want to invite a, a very good friend of mine uh, who we've known each other for well, over 10 years now. It's kind of crazy to to think that we've known each other for that long. But uh, Troy Hebert, um, he's currently in New York, uh, and he's been active in on the LP side uh, for quite some time on a variety of different uh, commercial real estate transactions. And so we're just kind of kind of dive in a little bit on that uh, section of the the investing landscape. So uh, Troy, welcome. Good to see you, yeah. my friend. No, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, yeah Rafael and I've been talking about these types of things for years now, and we kind of said, well, at what point can, does it make sense for me to come on and, and kind of have a conversation? And um, I think we're finally able to to connect the dots and do something that might be relevant here. So I'm excited. Absolutely. And for those of you guys who don't know, actually, Troy's going to be coming into town here shortly. So I'm going to be picking up from the airport <laughs> for the derby. Yeah, I was, so. push, I was pushing for maybe an in, in-person kind of podcast. A little I know. Now but I don't, I don't think uh, maybe for round two, we can do something like that. Oh yeah. There'll definitely be a round two. And obviously we've yeah. been doing this for the last several years now. We've grown a pretty grown big, a pretty big uh, group or a broad audience that we've, we've reached all across the nation. So um, I'm looking forward to bringing you back on at some point as well to talk about other things as well. But before we, you know, dive into the meat and potatoes of the actual discussion, I want to kind of give people some context about your background. So if you don't mind sharing that, I think that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So, um, Unlike probably a lot of the folks that come on Raphael's podcast here, um, I have a little bit of a different background, still in kind of the same space, but, you know, within finance, but um, really came from the investment banking world um, in corporate M&A and uh, spent a lot of years kind of in a variety of capacities around, you know, big name shops, smaller shops, um, you know, doing, you know, actual transaction work and connecting buyers and sellers uh, for, for opcos, I guess we call it in the real estate side. Um, and, uh, also kind of financing th those transactions from the credit credit side of the, the world. So whether that was with a bank or private credit, um, and then on the equity side being, you know, a private equity, uh, investment professional and kind of working through, um, you know, 20 active investments, we looked at, you know, 600 deals a year. So we were very active in the space. Um, so kind of investing across the cap structure from senior debt down to common equity, um, which is still relevant for real estate. You know, when you kind of scale up, you have the senior lenders, maybe a mes lender in place. Um, and then you have the variety of, of equity splits. Um, you know, a very traditional simple structure is kind of equity, but, you know, you can get into complex GPLP structures like we're going to talk about today, uh, preferred equity on the, all those types of things. And so I kind of just spent the last 10 years or so, you know, learning and, and kind of working in a variety of capacities um, within finance. Um and now I kind of lead the New York market for an M&A technology company. Um, so I kind of got out of the principal investing landscape and kind of now service transactions, um, which has been great. So, um, but, you know, with, with that over the years, I've had a variety of opportunities to invest in real estate and, you know, not working directly in it, but really the ability to kind of still be involved and kind of analyze transactions, source transactions, um, and, and really kind of think about, you know, all the different types of deals that you can do. That's amazing. Yeah, no, no. As, and as you mentioned, I mean, you've been in the transaction space for quite some time. I mean, obviously yeah. on the M&A side uh, for what you've been doing. So at least I'm sure you can draw some parallels to what you did before that you can then yeah. apply to the commercial real estate space. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to kind of hear uh, your take on a few things that we talk about today. So one thing I'm kind of curious about is why commercial real estate? I mean, obviously you have a lot of experience you know, on the M&A side, why not, you know, start, you know, kind of focus on in that direction. I know you did for a little while, but if you could kind of touch on why, you know, you decided to kind of diversify into the commercial real estate space, I think that'd be beneficial. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, you come up in, and you kind of come up in your career and you start learning about other things. And I think YouTube has done a great job at kind of introducing the idea of real estate investing. Now I'm, you know, not going to, um, you know, have a further conversation with regards to how effective, you know, those online classes are or anything like that. But I think, um, you know, I think ultimately the social media kind of gets you aware when you start kind of diving into things online. And so naturally I thought, you know, how do I start getting into passive investing and, and kind of without buying a company and having to operate a business? Um, how do I get a piece of something from an equity perspective where someone else manages it? Um, you know, initially that was going to be me. 
I said, maybe, you know, I'll be a landlord and I'll, you know, buy a duplex with my FHA loan and put two and a half percent down and I'll make, you know, five X my money. Right. And, and I think, um, you know, my roommate back um, in Connecticut was actually, he was at a hedge fund, but he got his real estate license. And so I asked him, I said, well, you know, what are you doing with that? It's kind of a strange path. I mean, he was at Millennium, so it wasn't just like a $50 million fund. I mean, they're, you know, a Citadel style hedge fund. Um, and he's like, look, I, I think there's opportunities in the space and we're learning about it and we're doing distress and we're doing commercial and we're doing this and that. And so it was really interesting to kind of hear him talk about it. And so I got access to his uh, MLS and started kind of looking at deals myself. Um, and so, you know, you just peel back the onion. I built a super complex, robust model for like a single tenant, <laughs> you know, multifamily real estate deal. Um, you know, just kind of just coming from the background, thinking that's what you need to do. But um, yeah, I mean, it was one of those things. You know, I looked into it. Um, I looked at a hundred transactions, um, really not a lot of them made sense, but I was just focused in Connecticut and the sub markets that I was looking at and kind of the regions didn't make a ton of sense, um, for, you know, outside capital and kind of stringing together one, one small property. Um, and, you know, so I started looking elsewhere, um, and I ended up looking in Florida, looking at, you know, in other areas of the East coast and ended up in the outer banks, um, where I bought kind of, a a 10 bedroom, 12 bath, massive home on the beach, but purely kind of a, you know, rental, weekly rental, vacation rental type style property um, in, in 2020. And so I've since exited that deal, um, but it was a great opportunity for me to kind of get exposure to active management. I did have a management company, but you know, when it's not your property, even though you're paying them 17%, which I think is a pretty hefty fee for a property manager, um, you know, they're, they're still not as invested as you are. And so I still was involved. I was still trying to, you know, kind of work with whether it was, you know, renovating the back stairs so that people didn't potentially die, you know, if there was an issue, um, you know, because the stairs were starting to become lopsided. When you live on the beach, the salt, the salt air kind of breaks down wood and, and, electrical boxes and all that. So I didn't budget in as much of a repair and maintenance or CapEx reserve as I probably should have, but these are the types of things you learn. Um, the, the deal went exceptionally well, but that's besides the point because it kind of hit the market on an upswing and on the macro side. Um, but uh, overall, I said, look, you know, I want to continue having exposure to this and having real asset exposure um, where you look at a real estate property as effectively a, a mini business is kind of the way that I view it. You could buy an industrial business or healthcare company or whatever, and there's all these complexities. But at the end of the day, there's revenue, there's costs, there's operating expenses. You have a bottom line, you have capital expenditures, you have cash flow, um, outside financing. And so I think a lot of it is comparable from a cap structure and an operating perspective, just that the real estate asset is your business, right? That's, that's where you generate your revenue. And then what does it cost to generate that revenue? And so that's kind of the way I've looked at it. And that kind of led me into the path of, maybe I should be an LP in some of these private equity real estate firms where they're sourcing the deals. I'm able to look at all of them on an individual basis and analyze which ones make sense for my risk profile. Um, and then, you know, kind of pick and choose what I want to, what I want to play in and, and ultimately not manage it. And, you know, maybe I pay a carried interest, but that cost is worth it when you think about net returns and kind of what I, the effort that I'm putting in as truly passive income. And so that's kind of where I'm at today with regards to my personal real estate investing. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. And, and you threw out a few terms that I think we, we're going to definitely elaborate a little bit on as we got dive further into the discussion. But if you sure. could kind of elaborate, because you did mention LP, GP, obviously, you know, it's, it's a particular type of structure for, for a particular deal. Could you kind of elaborate what exactly is an LP and then what is a GP? And then, you know, we can kind of dive into the different nuances as we progress throughout this episode. Yeah. So GP, general partner, LP, limited partner. That's all I'm going to say about it. No. Nice. Good stuff. <laughs> no, next no, next no, question. Next question. Yeah, yeah next question. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, so GPs, LPs, it's kind of a, a traditional legal structure um, where I got first exposed to it on the private equity side. So whether you're in real estate or your opcos, um, you know, effectively, you can either raise outside equity capital on a deal by deal basis. Um, or you can effectively raise a close-end fund. And so you go out and you say, okay, I'm going to raise, maybe for my first fund, it's $225 million. 
um, of equity dollars and you go to a bunch of potential equity investors and they raise and commit capital into kind of a 10 year model, if you will. Um, so usually that's split between a five year investment period and a five year harvest period, at least for private equity. Now, I don't, I don't know for sure if it's too dissimilar for real estate, but I'd imagine it's not because you still have capital you have to put in for either distressed opportunities or deals that you were in um, or just holding assets that are clipping a nice coupon and are doing really well and you're waiting for the market to turn to sell it. And you don't really want to sell just because your investment period's up. So you have a five-year harvest period to really you know, maximize your, your exits. Um, and so you can have the closed-end model, you have a fundless model. And the GP is effectively the the, the asset manager. So if you work at a private equity firm and you kind of have a, a, a deal sourcing person or team, they bring the transactions in, let's say it's real estate and I'm just going to focus on value add multifamily. You know, we bring in folks that are going to um, just really look at in, in source deals across the country or maybe where our specific sub markets are um, for value add multifamily. Then we're going to have an investment team that's going to analyze those transactions and the structure and maybe structure the deal um, and then kind of get investment committee approval to submit an LOI to purchase the property. Um, but kind of if you're looking at it on a, on a macro basis, you have someone who's the sponsor, we call it. Um, and the sponsor is kind of the private equity firm that's managing the deals. Um, and then you have the LPs, which are the outside investors putting capital in to the fund or to a particular transaction with the sponsor. Um, and so you're really just a, what we could call it kind of a traditional investor. Um, you're a limited partner from a legal perspective where you're kind of limited to your investment and, you know, not to the asset manager, but um, you know, that's kind of the, the structure and the GP will typically put, you know, 3% in, if you're doing a closed end fund, they might do 3% of the total fund of their own money. Um, but then, you know, the LPs are really committing the rest. And so there's a typical structure as well as, okay, well, you know, how does the GP get paid for all this work that they're doing? I'm happy to walk into that, but, you know, effectively they get a management fee and they get carried interest based on the performance of the fund or the specific deal. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And and really, I mean, the, the premise really is that the, the, the asset managers, those who are executing the business plan are the GPs and typically the LPs are the ones who are providing the fun, the funds for, for the project. And, and obviously, you know, the GPs tend to submit or, or contribute some form of capital, but it's much less in, in, in size than it would be on the LP side. Uh, but yeah. that's kind of an exchange for them act actively managing the deal to make sure they can execute that business plan. So uh, I appreciate that clarification on that front. Um, you know, as, as, as we mentioned, uh, you know, how are these deals, like you said, typically structured, how are these GPs getting paid? How are the LPs getting paid? And before we dive in this, I just want to clarify we're not providing any legal advice or financial advice or anything like that. So again, uh, it's more so just trying for more informational purposes. Yeah. So that you can go down the rabbit hole of, of, uh, in GP LP interest on your own. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So effectively, um, I'll, I'll take the example of what I typically do. I don't invest in closed end funds because I like to have access to liquidity. I like to choose the deal I want to be in. Um, so there's certain firms out there that are, I call them fundless sponsors, independent sponsors. I think the market will typically call them, but they don't raise a fund. And so they'll do a deal by deal. And, um, you know, on those types of situations, I get sources where the, the deals are coming into me. I look at value add multifamily. I look at, um, healthcare deals. I look at, um, I just did an industrial deal out of California, actually. Um, and now most recently looking at some retail deals as well. Um, that are active, um, that, that we're actually fundraising for right now. So there's, um, you know, all types of different transactions, but you, you have a sponsor that's going to bring it to you. And then the way that they effectively get paid as I'll call it the GP is they'll take a management fee. Typically in Opco land, it's on the company. Um, you know, so every year the, the actual business is going to pay 2% of, of revenue, or to you know five percent of EBITDA or some type of structure like that to the the sponsor, um, and that's really to cover the operations of the sponsor's business. You know the, the hiring management teams; they're really managing the business. At the end of the day, you have a CEO and a board, maybe an executive team, but but those types of folks, um, you know, might have some equity, but the actual owner of the business is still the sponsor. Um, so they will usually take a management fee, um, you know, from the business. But in these cases, the management fee 
will come from, you know, the closing proceeds usually. So the sponsor will take an acquisition fee in, in real estate I've, I've typically seen. Um, you know, the percentage of that varies depending on what you negotiate. But that fee is to kind of fund the operations of the GP or the sponsor. And then depending on how the transaction goes, um, the sponsor will, well, the typical structure is that there's a there's an annual preferred return hurdle. It's kind of a, a mouthful, but it's effectively a minimum investment return that the LPs get per year. So call it 10% is what I've, I've seen. I've seen 8%, but let's call it 10%. And so the idea is that the LPs get every dollar um, for the investment in, in gains up until a 10% per year compounded annually. And so that's kind of their minimum investment. So if the investment achieved a 5% IRR and you exited in five years and that's you're looking back, that's kind of what it was. The LPs are going to get all the money. The GP doesn't get any money. Um, in the situation where they return funds in excess of 10% a year, um, and the reason I'm using the annual percentage as opposed to 2x your money or something like that is because that's typically how the, the preferred re return hurdle is structured, because you can hold an asset for 10 years or you can hold an asset for 18 months if you're doing potentially like a new development project or something. Um, and so, you know, these types of structures um, can change, but anything in excess of the 10% is considered what we'll call gains. And then the sponsor will take their carried interest from the gains. And that is, I've seen 30% of, of the gains and the other 70% will go to the LPs. And then you get a little bit more complex and you could say, well, you know, maybe if you, if the sponsor, if the LPs got three and a half times their money, now you do a catch up provision. And therefore the, the GP gets every dollar until as if they were made a whole 35, 65 or something complex. So, but you, you know, every structure is different um, and you kind of go through a negotiation phase with the sponsor and on the deal and, you know, you kind of land at that prior to the transaction closing. That makes sense. No, that's, that's, I appreciate the clarification on that front. And, and you, as you mentioned, it, it is a kind of a, a, a negotiation prior to the, the, the consummation of the actual transaction. And then that document that you've kind of agreed to is now the, the living, breathing, uh, you know, document that kind of dictates how the relationship is going to go forward. So. Yeah. Uh, as far as go ahead, I was gonna say, which is not to say you can't amend those documents, right? Mm -hmm. So things are 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 changing, and and you have certain outs in the provisions of the operating agreement or the subscription agreement or whatever kind of structure you you've done. Um, you know, you can always amend those agreements. It's not written in stone. You typically won't amend those agreements. Things, in my experience, are typically going pretty well. Um, but in distressed situations, things have to change. New capital has to come in. Um, you know, committed capital might not actually execute on their committed capital, um, you know, commitments. I've seen that happen before. So just kind of mentioning that as well. But to your no, point, it, these things are structured in advance. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. No, I appreciate the feedback there. So obviously, you know, let's say that, you know, you're an individual and you, you obviously are an individual and you, you've looked at these different opportunities. And, and I'm imagine the first few deals that came across your desk that you found in, intrigue in, you started doing a little bit more research on, you know, the potential opportunity and to see, you know, what, what issues may arise if, if any. So what type of, uh, I guess, vetting do you do on your end? And, and I guess if you could touch on maybe some of the key points that you look out for as you're trying to analyze some of these opportunities. Yeah. So if you're an outside investor looking at, let's call it a $50 million value add multifamily deal, right? So you're, you're going to be buying 300 units, one, one apartment complex, maybe in Nashville, Tennessee. I don't know, just off the top of my head. You know, ideally, the investment memo that you get from the sponsor or the GP um, is going to be, you know, pretty robust in nature. It's going to hopefully outline the submarket, um, you know, the region, you know, various other, um, you know, commercialized properties in the area, other deals that were done in the area. So hopefully you get a comp set. So you can descend sets to dollar per square foot for that particular, you know, type of property. Um, and then it, hopefully it's going to outline, um, you know, some, some financials um, historically and then projections and you'll get a financial model. And in that model, it's going to have kind of the deal structure. So what's not atypical is to see your sources and uses. And that's very comparable to operating companies as well. You know, a lot of this stuff is going to be comparable to operating companies where, Okay, we're having a transaction. What are the sources of those funds? You know, I'm going to get new senior debt. I'm going to get mezzanine debt. 
I'm going to have common cash equity coming in. Maybe I'm going to have a seller note. That's going to also be a use of capital, right? Because um, the uses are going to be, where does that money go? So maybe there's existing bank debt or, or mortgage on the property that gets paid off. What about what's in excess of that? You know, typically we'll, we'll go through something called an exit waterfall and it'll actually just say, here's the transaction value. Here's transaction expenses. Here's money that goes into escrow. And then it just flows through based on, you know, seniority. Um, and so, you know, ultimately you'll probably get to a line that says cash to equity investors or cash to sellers. Um, and so seeing that source of uses, you know, it can get a little bit more complex. You could say, okay, what's the value in multifamily? What about renovations? What about CapEx uh, reserve? You know, those types of things that you, you have to kind of put aside in cash, um, you know, to actually make the renovations and actually make the improvements that you need to, you know, pro forma stabilize the property. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of analyze everything about the deal. Um, you look at the sponsor, you know, what are the sponsor's prior transactions? What are the returns of their typical deals? Is this the first time they've done this type of investment? Have they done, you know, multifamily and now they're going to be doing a skilled nursing facility? Um, are they specializing in the Texas market or a particular market? And now they're going to do a deal in Alaska or something, right? So you kind of take a look and you, you look at, you know, precedent transactions. The other thing I'll typically look at with sponsors is, um, you know, when they did deals. So, you know, ideally they've gone through a market cycle, you know, so you might have, let's just say you did deals in 2018 and you, you exited all of your transactions in 2021. I can almost guarantee as long as, you know, there was no fraud and, you know, they, they executed generally on the business plan for value on multifamily, they made a good return, right? So it was almost like, the, you know, the, the market rose all tides and everyone got paid good money, cap rates compressed, interest rates went down to zero. And now we're kind of seeing a reversal of that, um, as I'm sure most folks are aware of. But, you know, ideally, you're kind of looking at all these things to say, you know, what are they buying it at? Who are they? What are the financials look like? You know, NOI is one thing, but what about debt service? What is the, what is the free cash flow going to look like? Do they have enough money for CapEx reserves? Um, do you model in a, a potential buffer for renovation costs? Because nothing seems to uh, get done right on budget, always on time and on budget. So maybe look at what kind of uh, buffer they put in place. Um, you know, look at the transaction. Is it well equitized, right? So if I'm going to come in, and you're five or 10% equity, and they were able to get financing up to 90%, that's great. You know, you're gonna have a lot of leverage, but what happens if, you know, you do have issues and, you know, you're suddenly, you know, 90% transaction value from what you bought it at. Well, now you have no equity in the, in, in the deal currently. Sometimes the sponsor will walk away from those types of transactions if they don't see an out. So now they're just managing the deal and they don't see any upside in the carry. And every year they're, they're clipping that 10% preferred hurdle. And so you have to kind of, make sure that there is enough equity backstopping it, or if it's structured originally as a 90, 10 you know, structure like that, there's something called a, you know, an equity cure where, you know, it's requirement in the document that the sponsor puts more capital in um, on their side, sometimes the GP. Um, and so, you know, in those cases, you'll, um, you know, you'll benefit from additional cash coming in to make sure you can bridge whatever, you know, whatever situation is going on. Um sure. So yeah, that's that's not it's a pretty robust answer, but you know, effectively look at every deal individually and um you kind of take an assessment as to you know what makes sense for your typical risk profile. 100%. And and so, you know, just to kind of round this all together and again, we could talk about vetting deals all day. I mean, we could probably have three or four webinars on strictly that particular topic, but just just a brief overview for those of you guys who've been listening. Obviously, it's a deal by deal basis. You know, you're going to look depending on what property type you're looking at. You're looking at demographics, average area rents, maybe similar transactions that have occurred in, in an area to see if there's justification for what the actual purchase price are. Targeting the assumptions in the model, as you had mentioned, like do they have enough for capex? You know, exit cap rate. I know we were talking about you know some a deal yeah. recently, and they had assumed a pretty aggressive exit cap rate. So is that they're relying on that exit cap rate to justify the IRR that they're promoting to people? You know, if that if that I, uh, assumption is is skewed, then that's obviously going to affect you know what they can actually deliver as far as the business plan is concerned. So you know, you got the the property side, you've got the financial assumptions, and then you've got the GP. 
um, the, the ones who are actually operating it. Because a business plan isn't worth the paper it's written on unless the person or team that's in place is going to be able to execute on that business plan. So, you know, kind of going into that direction, you know, how are, I guess, what type of questions are you asking these potential sponsors? And then, and then I guess as, as, as another question to that, you know, how do you hold some of these GPs accountable? Because I could tell you one thing at the beginning and then as, as you know, start, you start getting into the the process, there may be something different. So um, kind of curious yeah. to hear your talk. Yeah. So I'll take the the latter question first, just because I think that one's easier for me mm-hmm. is look, I, I, I try to find the right sponsor mm-hmm. who has a track record of executing. And sometimes that sponsor is vertically integrated. Sometimes they have a management company they own. Sometimes they have a construction company they own. And so, it, you know, you kind of have to um, invest a little bit in the GP and, you know, that their prior execution as a small LP, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, a hundred percent of the equity here. There's only so much I can do. Um, you know, if you're on the credit side, it's a completely different story. You have covenants in place, you know, debt service coverage, those types of things. Um, but as an equity investor, you kind of just have to do your diligence up front and, you know, make sure that you get the right updates from the sponsor as things progress, you know, feel free to check in with them, uh, say, Hey, you know, what's going on with, uh, with the renovation. You know, a lot of times I'll get investor updates and they'll just kind of, you know, show what the percentage or kind of, you know, the, the deviation from plan where one is, okay, we're executing well above plan, better than expected. Two is pro forma. We're, we're doing, you know, pretty much where we thought we were going to be uh, generally and on time. And then you have a couple other buckets where things are falling behind or you have kind of a distress bucket, which, you know, we need capital, you know, otherwise this is going to be a problem. Um. And so you get you make sure you kind of set that precedent in advance with the GP to say, what kind of updates am I going to get? Um, and so I think that's that's really the big item with regards to keeping them honest, I'll call it. Um, and so I do want to mention real quick that even if you're the GP um, or even if you're just looking at investing in general, understanding financial modeling is is important. It doesn't have to be these complex like operating company models where you're, you're, you're building in a bunch of different scenarios and you have to you have macros and all those types of things. That's, that's good if you can do that. But the way for you to analyze the deal sometimes for me is to just open up the model and kind of just take a look at the numbers and say, oh, look at this. So there's a big jump in in 2024 from this property that had zero revenue before. You know, maybe it's I find out later it's a retail property and it's a vacant you know, vacant uh, unit, and they're going to plan to put someone in at the average square foot. But these are the types of things where you come up with those questions and say, okay, well, where do the questions come from? Those are the types of questions I'm going to ask and say, well, I saw in the model, this is, you know, this is changing, or, you know, I saw this is an $815,000 CapEx budget, you know, based on the commercial broker that I talked to, you know, it's probably $200 a square foot for building it out, but you're showing, you know, $120 a square foot. Do you, you know, is there a reason that you're light on it? Is, do you have a particular contract in place? Do you have, you know, are you going to end up building up only a portion of the, of the, the building? You know, you kind of have to just look at the numbers and, and gut check things. Um, and then you just sensitize it, like to your point. Okay, well, they're buying at a seven and a half cap and they're exiting at a five cap. Well, okay, is there a precedent on exiting at a five cap? And, and maybe that's great. But for me, I'm more of the downside case scenario. Yeah, we exited a five cap. Everyone makes a bunch of money. It's great. But what about that scenario when, you know, the market's got, you know, interest rates are going up and the spread between, you know, cap rate and interest rate is staying consistent as opposed to compressing like it is today. Um, and then suddenly what we think is a seven and a half cap, which is, you know, probably, I don't know, a straight down the fairway type retail deal um, becomes a 10 and a half cap. And that's kind of the market, which today you look at like class C or class D properties, you can find class you know 10 caps or 11 caps. Um, and so it's an interesting, you know, thought where you say, well, what about, what about that? What if I do it? What if we have to exit an eight cap? Um, and then you look at the returns and you kind of say, well, okay, well, here's the big issue. <laughs> if we can't exit at, at a seven and a half cap or an eight cap, well, that's a problem. So the next question is, how do you mitigate any problems? So I have a conversation with a sponsor and they might sit there and say, well, if you look over the next 10 years, we're going to have a triple net 10 year lease with, with a, a high credit quality tenant. Right. And so um, if the market suggests that we can trade it at an eight or nine cap at that time, 
we have the opportunity and the benefit of waiting it out and clipping a nice 11% coupon uh, from just cash flow. You know, pay down some debt service, um, you know, operating expense triple net. So all the operating expenses are paid for by the tenant. You know, we, we have tons of visibility with regards to our cash flow. And so we'll wait for the market to turn. And the worst case scenario is you're going to get 11% a year. You know, not really the worst case scenario is there's fraud. There's <laughs> there's a lot of other things like that. But that's that's probably more of your like downside base case scenario that you can kind of underwrite to. Um, uh, and that's how you get comfortable. That's why you, you, you allocate a few hundred grand to a, a one deal or something. You kind of say, okay, well, I don't worry about that deal because I know I've vetted all the downside case. I've looked at the model. I've looked at the downside case scenarios. I've thought about all the ways I could lose money. And so, you know, that's kind of answer your question. One of the questions I'm asking is like, what are the ones that are going to keep me up at night if things go south? 100%. Yeah. So and that, and that leads back to the the comfort level, right? So, you know, obviously, you know, what your risk profile is as an individual, because I'm sure there's people out there that, that want to be really aggressive when it comes to some of these, you know, returns, maybe they want to, you know, they're okay with taking on these massive distress deals that, you know, you're getting it at a steal, maybe, but you know, there's a higher side risk. And then there's other people who don't want to have any risk whatsoever. And they're okay with buying a, you know, a Chipotle 20 year triple net lease, and they just sit on it at a, you know, five or 6% return. You know, it's all cash. They don't have any debt, whatever. Right. So, but it just yeah, depends yeah. on that. It just depends on the individual. And so, you know, I appreciate you sharing that front. And I'm sure, as we mentioned before, um, you know, it, it's something that you, you learn as you start to do a lot more research. Um, yeah. I think the big thing is ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you're a GP or you're an operator, um, or kind of whatever your role is, maybe you're a lender, uh, whatever your role is in the real estate world, find someone that does these types of deals, go to a sponsor and, and say, Hey, I'm looking at investing in deals. You know, can you, can you get me in your flow? And then just get their investment opportunities and analyze the transactions. And you might start with, okay, what are the sources and uses and say, uh, what is, you know, what's the mezzanine debt? I don't understand why, why are you getting mezzanine debt? Just you know, write down all your questions and ask questions, right? And then you, over time, you'll kind of figure it out and as to what you might need to look for. Um, I think that's that's the key is just don't be afraid to find deals and then ask questions about them. Um, don't just go in blindly and kind of assume that the sponsor has done all the work. Absolutely. And, and, and understand that even if you don't understand something, it's okay to ask. I mean, part of the reason that you're getting into business, because you're getting into business with, with these GPs. So really it's a partnership. So if anything, yeah. they should be willing to sit down with you and explain things because if they're going to be taking a sizable amount of your money, which a lot of times this is the case, you know, they should be willing to do that and make sure that, you know, they understand what's, what's going on. So I appreciate yeah. that, that, that insight. So I'll ask one more question and then we're going to open it up to Q and a, cause I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience that want to be able to uh, ask, ask some questions. So, you know, as far as lessons learned from your experience, obviously you've invested in a few deals thus far. I'm not sure if you've taken any to completion as of yet. Um, oh, yeah. you, you have, okay, perfect. So you can provide that whole context as far as lessons learned. So what exactly yeah. do you think are some of the top lessons you've learned through going through the entire, you know, whole period of, of these types of opportunities? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the first one for me is to kind of what we already touched on is to make sure that you're doing the work up front, um, for any scenario that does occur down the road. Um, lessons learned for some case studies. I've done deals. The worst transaction that we've exited so far that I was an LP in, um, on the real estate side, I can talk all day about operating companies. There's all <laughs> I've invested in everything from a health, you know, healthcare, adult daycare center businesses to technology companies to, you know, from 5 million up to, you know, hundreds of millions. And I think the reality is that, um, you know, with real estate, the worst deal I had was one X by money in three years. So I just got my capital back. And then we've had deals where, you know, it was four or five X our money in, in 12 months. Um, one deal where we had a two times net return after paying 50% carry um, in 14 months on a new development deal in Dallas. And so, you know, it's, it, I've had kind of the full spectrum lessons learned are the market, the macro environment has a very significant impact on, on your returns if you're forced to exit at a certain period of time. So, you know, the, the one, you know, the, the, the downside case deal, it was in Houston. We bought in late 2019, early 2020. So pre COVID, um, and it was class C property and, uh, you know, multifamily value by multifamily. 
Um, but uh, COVID hit. We had tenants that couldn't pay rent. You know, Texas was a little bit um, less, um, I guess, uh, less forgiving than kind of the blue states with regards to, um, you know, funding the cash for for properties and these types of things. Like if you're, you're in New York and you're a landlord, you could still get capital from just from the fixed fiscal stimulus, um, you know, for the most part. And so they were bridging the gap. A lot of people were getting money to, to pay for rent and um, while they couldn't go to work. And, um, you know, that deal went south because we just we bought in at, you know, a pretty lofty rate. We weren't able to get the same kind of occupancy that we were expecting. Renovation took a lot longer than expected. Um, construction costs went up because inflation started hitting. And it was one of those things where we just tried to wait it out, tried to wait it out. The PPP money and, and the kind of all the fiscal stimulus money dried up. And then we weren't still, we were still having a collection issue um, with class C tenants. And, um, you know, ultimately we decided we get, we get an offer to, to, to sell it. We had paid down some debt. We had, you know, did collect some cash over, over the years. And so, you know, we were able to sell it for less than we bought it for, but uh, still get, you know, the LP's money back. And so, um, but that was a function of really needing to, to sell, sell the property at that time. It was, it was time. There's going to be more work for us to do that might've impacted our returns. And then you look at the flip side where, you know, the individual deal I did where I bought that house in Outer Banks, weekly rental property, um, you know, drivable for almost everywhere from the Midwest to the East Coast. And COVID hit and man, everyone wanted to go to those beach houses and vacation because everyone wanted to get out of their house, but, you know, they didn't want to fly. So they get a couple families together. One family stayed on the second floor. They were staying with the third floor. You know, I don't know if that's actually how it worked out there, you know. You know, some people probably were more okay with COVID at that time, but um, you know, you're outside, you're on the beach and that thing just completely kicked ass, um, you know? And so the market changed. Uh, there's a ton of demand for primary residential and uh, you know, we, we flipped it in nine months uh, really is how long we held that property. So it wasn't a tax effective uh, thing for me personally on the capital gains side. Um, but, uh, but it was still the right move because the market got very hot and we were projecting that when things started opening up as they were for the following season, people were going to start flying places. They're going to start going overseas, pent up demand. Um, and so maybe there was less demand for renting in, um, in North Carolina on the beach versus, you know, other alternatives. And so we thought maybe we weren't going to rent this strong the following year, but we should do this now before other people kind of start realizing it. And while the market's super hot on the sales side, while inventory is low, demand's high. So the lessons learned are, you know, you're going to be susceptible to the market that you're in. Things are going to change. But, um, you know, if you, if you think about a lot of those things in advance and you have a backup plan where, you know, our backup plan on the North Carolina property was we never really projected any appreciation of the property. We just said, what if it just never goes up? Let's just say it's stick, you know, that's what the outer banks kind of did for a while. It kind of was stagnant and didn't move very much from an appreciation perspective. So what happened that, you know, are we throwing enough cash to pay down debt? Are we going to have enough renters, even in a down market, like a recession um, where people are going to still come vacation? What does that look like? And in all those cases, it was still pretty good. You know, at some point we, we paid down enough debt. We have an opportunity to monetize it at the same entry multiple or cap rate, I should say. And, um, you know, you get really comfortable with that. Our thesis was very different um, from what happened because we ended up selling in nine months. But, you know, I think that's the biggest lesson learned is, is just to, to get comfort and make sure you have a really good grasp as to what you're working on um, and what you're investing in as an LP. That's great. Great advice, man. All right. Well, what we'll go ahead and do then is we'll open it up to Q&A. So for, the, for those of you guys who are listening, uh, go ahead and type away in the chat box if you have any direct questions uh, for Troy. Uh, I'm sure he's happy to answer any you have. In the meantime, I guess what what are some of the resources that you've uh, you know tapped into to kind of and obviously you come from a finance background, so you know obviously you you you've been trained in in this in this analysis piece. But if you had any other recommendations as far as you know places to go as far as securing some of this information or maybe even you know the the analysis piece, what would you what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean going back to basics, I took a course, um, an online course. It's probably still out there. It's uh, breaking into Wall Street. And because um, everyone kind of assumed somehow that you needed to do financial modeling to get into investment banking and 
but you don't really get taught that in school, at least maybe you do nowadays, but back, you know, over 10 years ago, you didn't really learn about LDL modeling. And so I thought that was a good course for me to really get in and kind of go through the Excel portion of it. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing for you to kind of, if you, if you aren't familiar with accounting, like you got to understand accounting because accounting is the language of business. And when you start looking at numbers uh, and financial statements and understanding how all of them flow, you know, you're not going into things blind. So I think that's probably the number one thing is to really understand the accounting of it. And you'll learn the accounting kind of doing deals, right? You say, okay, what's the rent roll? Well, that's your revenue, right? Um, okay, well, what, what about, you know, operating expenses? What about the utilities or um, these types, you know, repairs and maintenance? You know, so, so, so some of your expenses. Um, so this is kind of, you know, things that I think uh, the resources that you just kind of go out and try to, to learn on your own. And then, of course, leveraging deal flow that you get in and trying to really learn and see as many deals as possible. Because my experience, everything is relative. So you could say, oh, a company's got a 55% gross margin. Okay, well, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. I didn't know when I first started. I said, okay, 55% seems nice. <laughs> it's not negative. Um, but, you know, what is that good? Well, look at it in the context of other plastics companies. You know, if the company is a plastics company, for example, or in real estate, you know, NOI uh, as a percentage of sales. So your NOI margin, for example, or your free cash, free cash flow conversion you know, those types of, of metrics. I think that's just good to educate yourself on and just look at as many deals as possible. Sure. Um, so but I just see someone had a question here. In yeah, the, yeah, yeah. well, I'll read it out just for those of you guys who have been listening at a later time. So how do you go about finding funding for your projects if you're just getting started out? So I'm, I maybe you can comment on this. I know you've obviously done mo all your experiences LP on the LP side, but... Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, well... I do have a, a couple of things to share. So the first is um, finding somebody that can help you raise money. So raising money is super hard. Um, I think if you if you have a deal, for example, and you, you need to raise money for a deal, well, put together those investment packages I talked about. Um, anticipate questions from investors. You know what what's you know what's the interest? How are you mitigating uh, interest rate changes? You know. If investors might be uncomfortable with that. I just think about the potential questions, put together that memo, put to, figure out how to put together, put together a model, um, have that package ready, and then go to somebody that you know that knows people and say, hey, would you be willing to raise money for me? Um, and, you know, I don't know, this is not financial advice so or mm -hmm. regulatory advice, but, you know, maybe there's a referral fee, maybe there's an equity raise fee, maybe they get equity in the deal, maybe they're a consultant, I don't know. Um, but, you know, that's one way. The second way is there are firms that do this, which is actually how I primarily invest as an LP. So there's a private equity firm in Dallas, they're technically in South Lake, that I invest with um, as an LP on a per deal basis where they're not actually the sponsor. They find all the transactions. They have a bunch of different sponsors that are bringing them deals in a variety of different property types and investment arenas, you know, anywhere from like $10 million deals up to $150 million deals. And, um, they're basically an equity raising firm. So the GP in this case with the sponsor puts in 10% of the equity usually. So let's say it's a $10 million uh, equity chunk. Maybe it's a $50 million deal. You know, the, the GP or the sponsor puts in a million bucks. And then this other firm goes out and they, they syndicate the rest. They go out and they actually just raise the, the other $9 million. They take a 7% fee and they take some, and that comes off the investor's uh, you know, from the transaction close. Um, and then they take a, a piece of the carried interest from the, from the sponsor. Um, so it, it costs money, but you know, if you're a sponsor, you want, you need to get a deal done. You need to fundraise and actually raise money for projects. You know, it, it might be worth giving up a little bit of your carry. If the deal goes really well and you only put 10% of the equity in your returns as a, as a sponsor is still going to be very strong. Um, like very strong. Um, so maybe you're okay giving up some some of the funding to to outside, you know, an outside equity capital raising firm. Cool. And and it's that private equity firm at all vet some of these sponsors as well before they put the deals yeah. in front of their LP. So it helps with the additional layering and everything. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the sponsor doesn't even do the investment deck. the The team they have eighty people um, who you know not all of them are analyzing investments. They have mm -hmm. you know back office accounting those types of folks, but um, they have a big investment team that 
you know, they have guys that are finding sponsors and finding deals. And then they have folks that are saying, okay, here are the deals. Which ones are we going to do a pre-screening on? You know, how are we screening transactions? You know, and then they put together the model. They put together the, the memo. And then they have a, you know, 2,000 or 3,000 LPs, individual LPs. They don't do any institutional money. So they go to all these individuals and they say, hey, here's an investment opportunity. Do you want to take a look? They host a webinar on it. They do property site visits and they allow LPs to join. Um, they do uh, FAQs and eventually you get a PPM and a subscription agreement maybe. Um, but uh, but that's in a really effective way because there's a lot of folks that say, oh, I did this one deal with them. It went really well. I want to do more because I want to have access to direct real estate investing, but I don't want to have to do it myself. You know, and I'm happy paying, a, paying and carried interest, you know. If I'm still getting two times my money in five years or kind of roughly 20% IRR, I I don't really, you know, some people don't really care as much if they gave up, you know, another turn of that to the private equity firm or the or the sponsor. Definitely. Yeah. And and then obviously those returns are again, we gotta clarify this. It, 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 they, the, the returns themselves are deal by deal. So you need really need yeah. to do your own due diligence and everything on that front as well. So I, I always like to clarify that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, any other questions from the audience members? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank Anthony appreciates that. So, uh, well, awesome, Troy. I think I think Great. you answered. I mean, we we had a pretty in depth discussion, so I think you did answer a lot of really good questions. Um, you provide a lot of great insights to the audience, so we obviously appreciate your time uh, today. So, as far as you know, people wanting to get in touch with you, or you know, you know, maybe you can point them in the direction of different resources. What's the best way for them to be able to do that? Yeah, for me, I would. I'm a. I don't use social media all that much, but I do use LinkedIn. So, if you want to reach out on LinkedIn. Um, you know, DM me with a question or, you know, you want to uh, get into a certain aspect of real estate or operating company investing, you know, or M&A, please let me know. I'm happy to discuss with folks. Um, you know, I'm always, I always have deals going on. I always have stuff flowing in and out. Um, sometimes I pass on them. Sometimes I don't. So, you know, if you're looking for opportunities to invest, if you're looking for opportunities to, um, you know, learn more, just feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and happy to have a conversation. Awesome. No, and and I'll and I'll echo what what Troy says. I've known Troy forever. Uh, he's a good buddy of mine, and he he does phenomenal work. Um, you know, I've I I I test to his uh, you know, integrity and his his willingness to help out. So, um, so Anthony, no, so he asked if if Troy's based in Texas. No, he's actually in uh, Long Island City right now. So. <laughs> I I'm, in, gonna... I'm, in, I'm in New York. Um, ah, New uh, York. I'm just. Kidding. I think some of some of my friends would. Uh would say Long Island City is not part of, of Manhattan. <laughs> I might have to fly in every day. And, and some of them might be on this call as well. So yeah, no, yeah, we, no it's, it's, a, it's a running joke. Yeah, no, it, it's it's all fun. No, no, Troy's headquartered or, or staged or in New York City area. How about that? He's in the, <laughs> he's in the vicinity of Manhattan. So. I'm only I'm only five minutes from uh, Lex and 59th, but I'm uh, an out of towner. So yeah. <laughs> Well, well, Troy, we greatly appreciate it. And for, the, for those of you guys who listen to the podcast format, we're going to go ahead and include his uh, his LinkedIn in the description as well. So feel free to add him on LinkedIn. And if you want to open up some dialogue, that's obviously great as well. So again, guys, thank you all so much for stopping by. Again, like I said before, we do this every other week. We talk about a variety of different topics related to commercial real estate. Usually we focus on a particular topic and then, you know, obviously we dive deeply into uh, learning about that that topic. So thanks again so much for stopping by, guys, and we'll see you all next time.